for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday afternoon, December 27th, 1986. Midwinter Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Glenn and Irma Miller are the uh, teachers of the afternoon. This tape is a deliverance service. Praise the Lord. Okay. <clears throat> the Lord for Earl helping with that PA system because... I need, some, I need some extra help there to take care of that thing. And I appreciate it. Well, <clears throat> this afternoon, uh, we're going to, at least I am, uh, uh, I'm going to relate some incidents found through, well, not, not too far past that have happened that have led us to a better understanding of deliverance and what, and what it what it is and the, and the reason for it and uh, uh, why we feel so strongly about it the things that uh, Irma and I have uh, to talk about deliverance are things that we have experienced and things that have happened by a sovereign act of the Lord it's not uh, something that uh, Irma and I ever uh, intended or thought that we would be involved in uh, years past uh, and it's it's the farthest thing from from uh, our our thinking, and here we are. Uh, really, I guess you might say it's some of the foremost deliverance place or teachings that's in America, and uh, it's not by our own doing. I'll tell you, I ever would have wanted anything to do with really, but the Lord has called us to it, and. And by the grace of the Lord, uh, I want to be faithful to what he's called us to. He's called us to help and, 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 and deliverance. And uh, the Lord's people uh, are sure in need of help. Every, on every side, wherever you turn, that, uh, that there's those who, who need help. And, uh, but I was taught as a Christian uh, by my... Uh, Pastors, uh, not so much by what they actually said, but by how they acted, and by in, in Bible school that uh, uh, demons and uh, evil spirits and such uh, were not in the church; they were someplace else. But no way could they be in the church. And uh, uh, if you see some of the things that go on in the church, it makes you wonder where they got that idea. Because where else would Satan be better to be than stirring up the things in the church? You don't have to stir it up out there. It'll take care of itself. But in the, in, in the middle of the body of Christ, why, that's where he's working the hardest. And uh, uh, so, so uh, we get to learn that. And we, we've learned quite a bit about it. We've still got a lot more to learn. The Moody's have learned and others. We've still got more to learn. But... Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's a revelation and an astounding, uh, I don't know how to express it. It's, uh, it's beyond our imagination when, as you get involved in it, uh, how Satan uh, has intertwined his way in, in, in throughout uh, the, the family of the earth. And he, he's intertwined in such a way that it's evidently going to take a thousand years to get him untwined. People think of the millennium as a time of, of glory. Well, that will be true, too. But it will also be a time of untwinding all that Satan has done in these years that he's in, inhabited the earth. We're, we're, going, we, we're going to have the authority to rule with a rod of iron and untangle all that's happened in, in, in these years since man has been upon the earth and how he has uh, twisted everything and, and turned it so that he is so entwined with the... With the the sins of his ancestors and with his, his own sins and with the, the curses that, that are upon the earth, that it'll take a thousand years to get that all cleansed out. 
We never think of it in that light. We think that the millennium is going to be a time when everything's going to be joy and happiness and everything's going to be uh, a heaven on earth. Well, it will for some, but for some, of, but for others, it'll be it'll be hell before hell, because the, the Lord says that He's going to rule with a rod of iron. And nobody knows what that is yet. Nobody's been ruled. Nobody. Everything's been grace, 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 and nobody's been ruled with a rod of iron. But that day is right at hand when the Lord will begin to rule with that rod of iron. And to some it will be joy, but to most it will be almost hell on earth. Uh, if that if that is possible, uh, uh, <clears throat> Tommy read uh, over in Psalms 42 and 7 this morning, and it said to bring and in that place it's, uh, the scripture said to bring my soul out of prison. Well, many of God's people are in prison there, and and the great commission of Jesus in, in Mark uh, uh, 16 uh, verses 15 to 18 is to set the captives free. Jesus gave the commission there in Mark uh, uh, 16, to go and set the captives free. He said to heal the sick, to raise the dead, and to cast out devils. And he is speaking to the household of faith when he said that, that the household of faith is bound captive and they need to be set free. Well, uh, we, you, you say, well, I've been taught or I've, I, I've understood that Christians can't have, can't have evil spirits. They can't have, well... If that's true, what do you think uh, causes somebody to get mad and throw a mad fit, and even throw a butcher knife or a hammer or something, and yet they're supposed to have the Holy Ghost? Huh? Or some other uh, thing that, that they do, fly off the handle or, 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 or do something that's, uh, that, that's really unreasonable. And you know it's not natural, so there has to be some power behind it, something uh, that, that caused it. And uh, uh, if we disobey God's laws... Even though we do it ignorantly, we still are subject to the penalty. And, and we need to have a, an understanding of what God's laws are. And uh, I never had an understanding. I still don't fully understand. I'm learning, but I have learned some of the things in the last few years <clears throat> of what God's laws are and that the consequences that come if we don't obey the laws of, of the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> uh, you, even though, you know, you say, well, I didn't know any better. Well, I know you've done it ignorantly, but God's law still is the law. You know, you, you, you disobey the, the law of the land, and and, uh, and you still are responsible for it, even though you sometimes didn't know that you did it, yet you're still held responsible for it if you're caught at it. And uh, <clears throat> But the, the word of the Lord, we don't, we're not caught at it. It's just there. The laws of God are there, and, and the Lord expects us to, to read and study and to understand them and and then to apply them to our lives so that we don't have to pay the penalty for it uh, and, and, suffer, and suffer because we have disobeyed the word of the Lord. Uh, I ignorantly, when I was a young man, uh, disobeyed the laws of my physical body, and I've suffered ever since because of it. I drank too much milk, which caused my system to have too much calcium, which caused my system to make stones. And ever since I've been a young man, I've had a problem with, with that. And it's because I disobeyed the natural laws and caused my system to be off balance and, 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 ca and caused it to, to uh, uh, react in a way that has caused me problems in that area even up until uh, two months ago. And uh, it's not, it wasn't God's fault. I can't blame God because I drank over a gallon of milk every day and caused my system to come to a place where, where it couldn't handle it. I never drank water. I only drank milk. Your system can't handle that. It can't take it. And if you, if you do that to your system in any other way, in any other form, uh, alcohol, why, well, you'll get cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, take drugs and you'll blow your mind. Or something else will happen to you. Uh, uh, to, to do something else that's contrary to God's laws or to nature, uh, which is God's laws. You do, you do that and, and you'll suffer the consequences. And... Uh, uh, so, so we, we have to uh, uh, search out and seek to understand the, what God's laws are and then to abide by them. You know, uh, uh, so somebody uh, has arthritis. Well, maybe the arthritis is, is, uh, is some of your own doing. I'm not saying all arthritis is, but I do know that some of it is. Some of it is because of, of bitterness and, uh, and unforgiveness. 
for people who have bitterness in their heart and unforgiveness against uh, somebody uh, have a good chance of having arthritis. And uh, to get rid of it, you have to get rid of the unforgiveness and the bitterness, and then the arthritis will take care of itself. If you really get rid of it uh, and, and forgive and, 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 and get that out of your system, then your body will correct itself and will renew itself and the arthritis will go away. Or God can do a miracle and he can take it away in an instant of time just by, by prayer and deliverance, which he does many times. But many times it's a process of the body then restoring itself. But you have to have deliverance. You have, have to get rid of the cause. And the cause is your bitterness or your unforgiveness. And ask the Lord to forgive you. And, and uh, most of the time when it's gone that far, where well, there's, a, there's a, a demon spirit of arthritis, and you have to get rid of it and get it cast, cast out or get some help or be able to do it, uh, you and the Lord do it, which you can. Or uh, somebody has a heart attack. Well, all heart attacks are not just caused uh, from overwork. Some of them are caused because you don't, didn't eat right. And you've brought it on yourself. It's your own. You've eaten a lot of fats and, and, and things that have contributed to it. And you have hurt your body. And... and and God's not responsible for that. It's your fault. We can't blame God for it. But the Lord is merciful and he turns around and helps us. And he'll heal us and deliver us. And, and, be, and we'll be set free as we call on the name of the Lord. And truly repent and, and search out to, to serve the Lord. Uh, sugar diabetes. Uh, uh, we had an unusual circumstance with some of these things to life. Uh, and in the area of the uh, of the word of the Lord and God's laws concerning uh, these things, uh, sugar diabetes and hyperglycemia, uh, we found by uh, a sovereign act of the Lord right here in this place uh, that uh, some of it. I'm not saying all sugar diabetes and hyperglycemia is from the same cause, but some of it is is uh, uh, caused because uh, we are our ancestors have disobeyed the, laws of the law of God. And in disobeying the law of God, uh, we have inherited the curse of uh, sugar diabetes or hyperglycemia. Now, we're, and so we'll, we'll look into that for a few minutes here. Uh, what I'm standing here telling you is that we have come this way by sovereign act of God and by revelations of the Lord, not by something that we've heard somebody else tell us or hearsay from another source what we stand here and tell you is what we know because we have experienced it either in praying for somebody else or in our own life. And we can't, no, nobody can, nobody can gainsay me. I don't care what they say. I don't care who stands here behind this pulpit. I don't care what, what, what they say about it. You can't change me because I know that I know that I know because I've experienced it. And until they have experienced what I've experienced, then they're not an authority on it. But when you've experienced it, then you're an authority on it. When I've experienced it, I'm an authority on it. And when I find the word of the Lord to back it up, then I stand solid on it. And I can't be moved by what somebody else says in theory or thought uh, uh, because I know the truth that I'm speaking. Uh, turn with me over to Genesis chapter 9. And we will look for a few minutes at some of these things, scripture-wise, and uh, to verify... The statements that I've been making. You know, uh, some of you have heard some of this before, maybe all of it. But uh, even to my own self, uh, I still don't get tired of reviewing it. Uh, somebody may say, well, I heard that before. Uh, I don't care to hear that again. Well, that's up to you. But uh, I've experienced it. I was here, here or, or, or took part in it, and yet I don't get tired of reviewing it. Because as, as I do, it indelibly implants in my mind that the word of the Lord is sure. And that we're to understand it and to live by it as best as we understand it. And ask the Lord to reveal that which we don't understand. And to open our understanding. There's a lot of things in here that I don't understand yet. And I pray God to open my understanding so that I'll understand and know that I won't do something that's contrary to his word. I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything that's contrary to the word of the Lord. I want to live by the word of the Lord. And in, here in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. <clears throat> and so the Lord says that you shall not eat blood. 
Uh, now, that's the first place that I know of, maybe there's, but in, in, in the Bible, where it tells us that the Lord says, you shall not eat blood. Uh, I found that later. <clears throat> the incident that I'm going to relate to us took place with Leviticus chapter 3. And then later on, I found this other verse and many more. There are many more. I will use three or four here today, but there are many, many verses that say the same thing that uh, we're going to look at here for a minute. In uh, Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 17, <clears throat> it says, It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. So there's both cases, fat and blood. And the Lord says that it's a perpetual and uh, uh, a statute. And perpetual has no end. So that means it's still in existence today. It didn't go away somewhere. It didn't stop someplace. And this law has nothing to do with Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And, this, and the offerings, the sin offerings, and, and the peace offerings, and all of that. This, has, this law has nothing to do with that whatever. This is a law that stands on its own merit, and it says it's perpetual, and it still exists today. So when we disobey that law, then we're subject to the consequences that come for disobeying that law. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute, but let's, uh, uh, let's uh, look over here in uh, uh, chapter 17 of Leviticus. You can hold your hand there where you're at. Let's look here at chapter 17 and verse 14. Just, uh, just to, to give you another, another reference right here. It says, uh, For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, You shall not eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Now, it doesn't say you're going to be killed or stoned. It says you're going to be cut off. So if you get, uh, if you get heart trouble and die, or you get sugar diabetes and die from it, you're cut off pretty good. So the, the Lord's got uh, different ways to cut us off uh, besides just to striking us dead, you see. And, and so, so uh, <clears throat> if something happens to us to the best of our ability, we need to try and find out what the Lord's trying to show us and then ask the Lord to forgive us and work on that area so that we come out from under uh, uh, the, the, the laws that we've disobeyed. Uh, now, I know that a lot of us have done it ignorantly, but that still doesn't... Uh, uh, cleanse us from the sin of it until we come and repent. And uh, we are so ignorant of the word of the Lord. And uh, I'm as bad and have been as bad as anybody else. I was ignorant of these things. And when I read that, it just went over my head, or I thought, well, that's all done away with. That don't apply to me anymore. But I've come to the realization that I was wrong, that it's not done away with, and it applies to me yet today. Uh, <clears throat> what happened here that brought this to our attention was about uh, three, four, three, four years ago this coming February, I guess, here in this auditorium. Uh, we were having a Bible study on Thursday night, and Becky Hall was here. And we were studying the aspect, different aspects of the blood of Jesus. In so doing, I used uh, this verse uh, 13 here of the third chapter of Leviticus as <clears throat> one of the verses for one of the aspects of the blood of Jesus that night. And uh, verse 13 says, And he shall lay hands upon the head of it and kill it before the tabernacle of congregation, and the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood. And what I was using was uh, the, the example that it was uh, appropriate to sprinkle the blood or say, I sprinkle the blood of Jesus uh, for a covering of protection. And then I finished reading it, even though at that time in my mind it had nothing to do, had nothing to do with what we were teaching or talking about that. But I finished reading the chapter, and in reading, I read the 17th verse, which says that you shall eat neither fat nor blood, and it's a perpetual in all your generations. And uh, went on, and uh, that night, the Lord woke Becky Hall up, who lives here on the campground right now. They're, they're in, in California. But uh, the Lord woke her up and told her that to study all the scriptures she could find on the blood, didn't make any sense to her, but she began, got up and began to study. And as she studied, <clears throat> the Lord showed her that the, the uh, 
uh, sugar diabetes that was in their family line was because their family had sinned the sin of eating blood. And she studied and found, searched out, and there are many scriptures about it. <clears throat> just for example, just to show you, let's go over to Acts chapter 15. Uh, we're not going to use too many scriptures over here in my study today, but just to, 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 to verify to anybody who uh, doesn't consider this to be one book, that is two different books, uh, let's look over here in Acts 15 and, uh, and, and see here. It says in verse 20 of Acts 15, it says, But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, uh, that, that's idolatry, serving another god, from fornication, that's sexual sins, and then the third thing, from things strangled and from blood. From blood. So the Lord picks it up and takes it over here in, in Acts and tells us again three things that, are, that he requires that we abstain from, having another gods before us, sexual sins, and blood, because the blood is the life, has the life therein. And then in verse 29, it says that again, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, for which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare ye well. <clears throat> then uh, in, in uh, Exodus <clears throat> chapter 20, <clears throat> starting with verse 1, we find here that what happens when we disobey the word of the Lord. The Lord tells us here what's going to happen to us. You say, well, somebody probably thought, well, how did her, Becky's ancestors, eating blood have anything to do with Becky? Because Becky said that she had never eaten any blood. But she found out and remembered that her mother told her that her grandmother and great-grandmother had made blood sausage and blood pudding, uh, which is contrary to the word of the Lord. So here in, uh, in Exodus chapter 20, we find it says, and, the, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of sin, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That, we found that back there in Acts. Uh, that there, you're not to worship other gods. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me or that do not obey my word. He goes on to say that he shows his mercy to a thousand generations, to those who search his word and apply it to their heart and, 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 and do that which, we, which it says for us to do. To a thousand generations that keep my commandments. Again, in Exodus 34, <clears throat> and verse 7, it picks up and repeats the same thing again. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. <clears throat> so, eating of blood is disobeying the word of the Lord, and it's one of the sin, it's a sin of Egypt. And, then, and that allows and, and calls for the sins of Egypt, which God says he won't put on us, if we obey his word, he won't put them on us, but if we disobey his word, we will get the sins of Egypt. And, and th th that is, is one of the sins of Egypt, disobeying the word of the Lord and, and uh, eating of fat and eating of blood. Uh, I consider that to be uh, one of the sins of Egypt. Now, whether the Egyptians actually did that or not, uh, I haven't researched to find out, but uh, uh, that, that's, that's not my point. My point is that if we disobey the word of the Lord, God says that then we'll get the sins of Egypt. And if you, the, if you read the list of the sins of Egypt, it says at the end of it, which covers it, he says, and all those that are not named here. So that takes in everything that, can, that you can think of or can happen that isn't even named there. God considers it the sins of Egypt. So uh, we need to study the word of the Lord, apply it to our hearts, and live by it and not do these things that God says is an abomination. But we came into this revelation uh, because of what happened here at the campground. And then Becky uh, <clears throat> come back the next Sunday. She didn't tell us anything about it. She came back the next Sunday morning. And during the service, she raised her hand and, and asked if she could say something. And, she, and I said yes. And when she 
uh, rose to talk. She told us just what I have already said to you. And then she said, I would like to have prayer that this curse be broken off of me. Well, that was news to me. I didn't understand about all that. But I said, we'll pray for you. Yes, that's right. And, and what had concerned her so was because she had been to the doctor and he had reported she was a borderline diabetes. Now, her, grand, her great-grandmother died of sugar diabetes. Her grandmother had died of sugar diabetes. Her mother had died of sugar diabetes. She had two sisters who were very seriously ill with sugar diabetes. And here she has now been told just this week that she's a borderline sugar diabetes, Betty. So she's very, very concerned about it. And that the Lord was gracious and made this revelation to her, which came from her to us, and we come into the understanding and knowledge of it. So we prayed for her to break the curse of her ancestral line, even though she hadn't eaten blood, we prayed for her, and God marvelously delivered her and set her free. And, and we prayed for the rest of the, for the children, that God would relieve them of that curse, uh, and, and, and God was gracious, and he did. So that's how we come into that, to the, the understanding about the curses being visited to the third and the fourth generation. Now, a lot of people say, well, when I got saved, all that got taken care of. Well, I wish that were true. That's what I was taught. That's what I believed. And a few years ago, you could no way have convinced me otherwise. No way. But you see, it takes these circumstances of life which change our understanding and thinking that we, we are changed. Little by little, he's changing me. And I hope he's changing you. And we can come to understand and apply the word of the Lord to our hearts and lives so that we can come out from underneath the plagues and the things that torment us both physically and mentally as we, as we come to the uh, correct revelation and application of the word of the Lord. Now, another thing <clears throat> that's rampant in the nation today, in the body of Christ, in the church, which should not be, and that's incest. Now, that's another thing that we came into an understanding of by a revelation of the Lord which about blew our minds at first. And since that time, why, there has been many, many that have come for prayer because of, of that uh, problem. Uh, incest in the family. In, uh, uh, inherited sins of the fathers, almost always it is, that's down in the family line. And I'm of the conviction, and we here at the campground are the conviction that everybody is in the, under the sin of incest. The sin of incest carries a curse of ten generations. And you can't tell me what you know about even your own parents, really. You think you know, or your grandparents you sure don't know, or your great-grandparents you don't have any imagination of really what happened or what was there. And so it's very probable that everybody, in some form, in one degree or another, is under the curse of incest that uh, visited down in the ten generations from, uh, of our family line. <clears throat> Now, uh, you know, the Scripture tells us that uh, in uh, Genesis 49 and 10, that the scepter would not depart from between the feet of Judah until Shiloh come. You'll find that in 49:10, and that means that uh, that there would be a ruling monarch in the line of uh, in the line of Judah until Jesus comes to become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I believe that that ruling monarch still exists in the world today, but that's not our topic. It has to exist because Shiloh, the Lord Jesus, hasn't come to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords yet. So there has to be a ruling monarch in the world today that still sits on, on the throne of, uh, of David. But that's not my point. My point is, it says here uh, in, in Genesis 49 and 10, that the scepter shall not depart from the tribe of Judah until Jesus comes. Now, King David became king, but King David could not become king until the generation of David. Are you aware of that? Are you aware that the tribe of Judah carried incest and that, Abra and that uh, David was a direct descendant of uh, 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 Phares, one of the twins born unto Judah by Tamar? It was incest. It was by uh, uh, Judah's daughter-in-law that, that, that the twins were born. And that was incest. And there could not be a ruling monarch come out of the tribe of Judah until the generation of David. Now, God gave Saul to be king, but, he, but that wasn't what God intended. He gave it because they demanded it. But if they'd have waited, they would have gotten what God had planned all along. 
they got it, but, but there was sorrow in the land because they got what they didn't want. But then David finally came to the throne. But he could not come. There could not be a king come to rule from the tribe of Judah, which was God's line, until the generation of David. Uh, uh, because, because the incest was in the line there from Judah from to Tamar and, 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 uh, and the daughter-in-law incest there until the, the generation of David. So, uh, uh, God, God keeps his word. And, and God's word, you, you can figure it out, you can see that that, God's, that, that applied to, to that line there because the incest was in the line. Uh, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, I can give you the other scripture, the, other, the, verse, the, the verse over here where uh, uh, this happened is in Genesis 38, verse 29, if somebody wants it for the record. Uh, but over in, Deut in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and uh, verse 2, it says, A bastard or illegitimate child shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation. Shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord? So here this law is laid down by the Lord, back here in Deuteronomy. So God had, God had to uh, 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 be faithful to his own rules, and he, and he was with King David. He was faithful. But it says, uh, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. And then it goes on to say, an Amorite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation, or four hundred years, well, approximately, shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Now, I wonder if, uh, how many of you know who the Amorites and the Moabites are? Lot's, Lot's, children, Lot's children by incest through his daughters. The Amorites and the Moabites are Lot's children by incest. And uh, you say, well, you know, when I got saved, all of that left. If that was in my line, why, I lost all that when I got saved. I know that's a popular teaching. I know that. That, that, that that's the, the, the main the teaching that when you get saved you get you free from all of these things well we've had some instances happen and we've had lots of people to, to pray for and so have the Moody's who didn't get set free from that when they got saved it's still there and uh, we had a uh, <clears throat> very unusual circumstance that brought that uh, uh, brought that uh, 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 very uh, uh, vivid uh, to us one time, and I'll tell you about it in a few minutes, so you understand where I'm coming from. But uh, uh, God is sovereign, and He can do what He will. And I know that a lot of people, when they get saved, lots of people get saved, they get delivered from all these things. I know that, but there's a lot of them that don't. There's, there's a, there are people who get delivered from alcohol and tobacco and, and drugs and other things when they get saved. And there's other people who have an awful fight from it after they get saved. They need deliverance. They have to be prayed for. The, the demons have to be bound and, and up and cast out of them. And, uh, uh, and, and it's just, it just so happens that it's that way. I can't explain it to you. I don't know why it's that way, except that it is. And so, since I know that, well, then uh, we'll be faithful to uh, pray for those when they come and say we've got a need in some way. Well, we'll believe them and pray with them and not say, oh, it can't be so. You got saved and you got the Holy Ghost. And that can't happen? No way. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that the voice of experience tells you that we know many cases where that's not so. They got saved, gloriously saved. They had a wonderful experience of the Holy Spirit, but they've still got these problems in their life. And they need help. They need your help. They need my help to get them set free from it and get them and, and delivered so that they can walk a victorious life before the Lord. I have no explanation for these things. All I can say is God's sovereign. And I'm glad that there's some of us around who are willing to pray in these areas for people. And, and, and understand that when they come and say these things are bothering them or they have these problems, that we believe them and, 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 and realize that, it's a, that, that they really are bothered in these areas of their life and that they do need help. Some people can say, well, I just laid the cigarettes down and they never bothered me again. When I walked out, I, I, I walked out of the bar and I've never been back. Well, that's, that's wonderful for, for you. But there's somebody else who hasn't been able to do that. So they need your help uh, uh, to, to pray for them in that area. Because you're free from it, and you're, so you've got some authority there, and you can pray for them. So you'll be available to pray for that person that needs that help. 
In Leviticus chapter 18, let's look at uh, here for a few minutes now at some of the relationships of uh, incest that the Lord has given uh, given us here in the Scriptures. <clears throat> Leviticus 18 and verse 6. We're dealing with incest and what the Lord says about it. It says, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. He just says, that's, 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 that's just, that's it, period. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father, the nakedness of thy mother, thou shalt not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. In case your mother's dead and he's remarried, it is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy fa uh, father or daughter of thy mother. In case your stepmother has a daughter that came with her from another marriage to, to your household. Uh, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. The nakedness of thy son's daughter or thy daughter's daughter, your grandchildren, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father, she is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. So the Lord lays out every aspect here of the family. If you follow that, search and study that, you have every aspect of the family relations. And God says that you shall not do it. <laughs> he don't ask you why. He just says, you shall not. And in, uh, back to verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying... Now, this is, the, this is not Moses' idea, which some people say Moses said. Well, Moses didn't say. God said. And Moses just said what God said. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of, uh, of sin, or Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Why? You shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. Why? Just simply because I am the Lord your God. He didn't ask you to say why. He doesn't give, God doesn't give you a choice. You have no choice. God says, that's it. That's what we're to do. And when you don't do it, you're in rebellion against the Lord. And that rebellion may cost you a short life. It may even cost you eternity if, the, if you keep on with it. But God says that we're to obey His laws. And He says that we're to teach our children these things at home. <clears throat> and, they need, and, and not only at home, but it's in the Word, it's to be taught from the pulpit. That we're to teach our children that we're uh, to, 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 to obey God's sexual laws in relation. And God, uh, God says that a man, and he's very explicit about it in other places, that a man and, and a woman, when they come together, should be virgins. And there's penalties and all kinds of things, uh, basically being stoned to death for not being a virgin. And that the Lord re requires that young people keep themselves clean and separated. And God requires young people, when they come to the time of marriage, God, the word of the Lord requires that you be a virgin. And so, so uh, all of you young people, search that out. And, and if you don't know what that means, ask your mom and dad what it means and let them explain it to you so you understand, so you don't disobey the word of the Lord and come under God's judgments, but you come under his blessings. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 20, we pick up again here, but we'll just read a couple of verses. It says in verse 11 of chapter, uh, of chapter 20, <clears throat> and the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. And uh, then in verse 7 it says, the Lord says, Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and do them. 
I am the Lord which sanctifieth you. So the Lord says that we're to keep these laws and do them. He doesn't say, would you like to do it? Do you want to? He gives a direct order and a command. He says, do it. We have no choice but to do it. And if you don't keep his, his commandments, you're in direct rebellion against the word of the Lord, which the Scripture tells us is witchcraft. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy chapter 27, we'll look at a couple of more verses here. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 27, verse 9 uh, and 10. It says, And Moses and the priests, the Levites, spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God, and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. He says we are to keep and do them. Then in verse 20, here in the same chapter, it says, uh, it says, Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he hath uncovered his father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. Verse 22 says, Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. And cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. And verse 26 says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now, in these passages that I have read, the Lord says, You shall not. He gives a commandment, says, You shall not. But then he carries it on some more, just, just, just so that it gets implanted in our thinking. In, in the, that was in the 18th chapter of Leviticus. Now, over in the 20th chapter of Leviticus, he picks it up again. And here he says, you shall surely be put to death. First he says, don't do it. Then he says, you shall surely be put to death. Then, down here now in Deuteronomy, he says, we're cursed. And we're cursed. So we're... Uh, uh, now, we live in a time of grace now. We're not put to death for these things anymore, but we still come under the curse. We still fall in the curse. And the, uh, uh, <clears throat> Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28 here, uh, uh, verse 13 is what I want to read. It says, And these shall stand upon Mount e uh, Ebal to curse... Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image the work of the hands. And cursed be he that saith by light his father and his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. So all the tribes stood one on one side and cursed, and another on the other side and blessed. And if you obeyed the word of the Lord, you received the blessing. If you didn't obey the word of the Lord, you received the curse. And that was agreed to. Everybody said, Amen, so be it, and, and, and uh, agreed to it. Uh, in verse uh, 9 and 10 here of uh, chapter 28, right across the page, it says, The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if you will keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. So the Lord says that if we keep his commandments and his word, then we will be an example before men, and, and all the rest of the world will be afraid of us. But we've lost that fear. The world does not fear the household of God. We've lost it because we have not obeyed the word of the Lord. But the day, the day is, is, is coming, and we're coming back to a day when there will be a people who, who do and will obey the word of the Lord, and and and. The rest of the world shall stand in fear of them, because they will administer the judgments of the Lord. Well, <clears throat> what made this thing about incest be become such a reality to us when we first become aware of it was we were over to uh, Old Roberts University uh, and, uh, uh, and had a uh, meeting with some of the kids over there at, uh, where, where did we have it at? Uh, Youth for Christ, in the Youth for Christ uh, Center in Tulsa. <laughs> And we had about, I think we had 35, uh, I think we had three or four instructors and all the rest were students from ORU. And we, uh, uh, I taught on incest. First time in my life I ever did it was there. Why I did it, Irma uh, couldn't imagine and I really couldn't either. But uh, that's what the Lord laid on me to teach and, and I did. And uh, uh, Irma thought, well, this is a foolish thing for him to be doing here before all these kids that's attending ORU. That this is not out of place. Well, it did seem out of place. 
but it wasn't. And when I got through teaching, I took authority over uh, sexual sins and sins of incest and bound them and command them to come out. And when I did, all hell broke loose amongst them kids. I mean it, literally. And uh, they were... And the first person of all people uh, that it affected was uh, one of the instructors. She was sitting on a chair by the door, and I thought she was by the door so she could get up and run out quick because uh, I never saw her agree or disagree with me. She just was stoic sitting there. And when I gave the command for these evil spirits to, to, to come out, she was the first one. She fell on the floor and with a scream and began to writhe across the floor like a snake. And then it followed suit throughout the rest of the uh, of those present. Uh, but then there was one young girl, uh, one young lady, about 18 years old or so, who was a beautiful blonde girl, and a couple of the other girls were praying with her uh, along toward the last, and, and I kept hearing her say, I can't, I can't. And they just seemed to get anywhere, and so I got, Irma finally got free, and I sent her over to help pray with, with this girl. And to make a real long story real short, she didn't want to go home. It was almost Thanksgiving, and she didn't want to go home. And she felt she could not <clears throat> let knowing what her problem was, what was bothering her. And finally, Irma and the girls convinced her, and she confided that she had been uh, molested. Ever since she was a little girl, this girl had been molested by her mother. And not only her, but her, uh, uh, her, her, her other sister and her two brothers. Her mother had, uh, had molested uh, all four of them, and she uh, didn't want to go home because she feared that she would be molested again uh, by her mother. Now, you say, well, what, what was her mother? Well, her mother was a saved, spirit-filled woman and had been all this girl's life. But incest was in that family and, and in her mother, and, and here it was, was upon these children, and, and this young lady, this, this young lady uh, felt that she could not go home to face her mother uh, uh, for the Thanksgiving holidays. And here, here I was, uh, this was an astounding revelation to us of how incest is so rampant in the body of Christ. Of course, since that time, we have prayed for multitudes of, uh, of people uh, who are spirit-filled, Holy Ghost people, even ministers. Who have, had, who have this problem in their life of incest. And they've come for help. And I thank God that God has given us an understanding and a revelation of it. I thank God that this happened. Uh, there with the students at ORU, I thank God it happened. And that he brought this revelation to us. So we had an understanding of it. So we were able, So since that time, we've been able to work and deal with people and, and, and help them to be set, set free from this curse that's upon, their, you know, upon them and upon their family line. They detest it that they, they don't want anything to do with it, but there's something that takes hold of them and drives them and compels them to do it. And that's true in other areas of people's lives. They are compelled in areas of their lives to do things. They say, well, that's a chip off the old block. It sure is. It's a demon spirit that just followed the family line right down, right down. Uh, that chip off the old block. And you need, uh, you need to be uh, set free from it uh, in the authority of the name of Jesus. Jesus said to, back there in, in, the, in the commission that he gave to go... Throughout the, to all the world and, and raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out devils. And they all go together. And I'm not satisfied that I've seen enough of it to even begin to put a drop in the bucket, but I'm believing that we're coming to an hour and a day when there's going to be men and women rise up with the power and the authority of the name of Jesus where we will see the, the dead raised and, 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 and every kind of disease and sickness uh, 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 done away with and the limbs restored to those who've lost them. I'm believing, I, I expect to see that in my lifetime. I expect to, to, to participate and be part of it. But uh, I'm going to be faithful to that which the Lord's called me to at this time to, to minister in. I'm going to be faithful to that which he's called me to. I don't understand how I ever got called to this. Only God knows. And, and how I ever accepted that calling is another miracle. Because it's the farthest thing from anything that I ever expected or, or, or would want to do is to be involved in the deliverance ministry. It carries a stigma. It carries a... Uh, 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 well, you're one of those, but it doesn't bother me anymore. It doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, not at all. God's called me, and I'm going to be faithful. I want to be a faithful servant of the Lord to fulfill that. And, and it's not easy. It's not easy. I'll tell you, it's not easy. But uh, uh, 
just, uh, but, but this curse of incest and these scriptures that I've read you from Leviticus and, and, and Deuteronomy uh, and, and about the, uh, 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 David and, and, and the curse of incest that was in the, law, in, in the tribe of Judah up until David uh, came, uh, uh, that, that it carries a, a, a curse for ten generations. And the only way we can come out from under that is that we come to the Lord and ask Him to, he, to deliver us and set us free. I, I thank God for, for the, the, the grace of God and that which He extends to those who He delivers sovereignly when they come for salvation and, and, or, or even when they get the Holy Spirit. And when I was a kid, they used to do what we called praying them through. And I never realized what it was until we began to get into deliverance ministry. And when we got in, I, I realized what happened when we were praying them through. I can remember being two and three o'clock in the morning and, and our folks, parents praying and others praying with people. And I remember seeing them rise on the floor and vomit and do all these things. And they called it praying them through. Well, what they were doing was delivering them. They were getting delivered. Amen. And, and, and God was, was setting them free and delivering them. That's what it was, old-fashioned praying through. And we need some more old-fashioned salvation, the Holy Ghost uh, repentance and praying through, and then we won't have so many problems in the, in the household of faith. What we need is old-fashioned repentance, crying out unto God to deliver me and set me free, for, for bring deliverance to me, Lord. Set me free. And if we cry out unto the Lord, uh, uh, the, the Moody's and us and others won't have to work so hard with you or in, with your problems. You, the Lord will take care of them for you, you know. Uh, uh, you need to learn to, to take care of some of your own things yourself and not be looking for somebody else all the time. Everybody's looking for a word from somebody else. Well, search out for yourself. Seek for yourself. Search, search for yourself. You, you be the one that does it. And God will honor you and set you free and bring deliverance to you. I, I know there's some cases that the people have cried for years and they, and, and they need somebody to help them. And I'm willing and ready to help. And, I, and, and I'm sure others are too. But there's many cases that you can help yourself. You can, you can do it yourself. But if you just get enough a backbone and, and, get, and get down to business instead of wanting somebody else to do your work for you. Quit being a, 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 a penny waste and wanting somebody else to carry you on their shoulder. Get down to business and do something for God and be something for God for yourself. But the Lord can use you and make you an example that, 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 that people will come to you for help. You be a helper. You be a helper in the vineyard. Amen. Amen. And not only that, you'll be able then to lead people to the Lord and be able to, to, to lead them in, in, in the, uh, not only through deliverance, you'll be able to bring them to, uh, to salvation and, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can pray for them for healing and you will know that you know that you know that it's going to happen. Amen. But you've got to get some backbone behind you and you've got to do something for God. We've got to quit playing church. we played church and we're getting worse at it. The churches are getting worse at it than, uh, than, than instead of better. But let us not be part of those. Let us be different. Let us be those who stand up and declare that Jesus is Lord. And by His name and authority of His Word, we will set the captives free. It is written. And when we declare it is written, Satan has to go. He has to go. When Jesus said it's written, Satan slipped off and left him. Because he told him it was written. And he had nothing to come back at him. He, he couldn't rebut him. He was had. And then Jesus come around and had him again at the cross. And he's been, and, but he's come back in tormenting us. And, 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 and he has legal rights to us in areas of our life when we give it to him. Just like incest. I think it's in every family. I've come to the conclusion that there's not a family that doesn't have some trace of incest in it. Back in ten generations or approximately 400 years, I'm of the conclusion that it's in every family. In one way or another. In some ways, it, it shows up stronger, but it's there in one way or another. The, the, spirit, of, uh, the spirit of incest. And, and what a revelation it was to us when the Lord uh, uh, caused that to happen amongst this group of students. And then the Lord brought that revelation to us. And how terrible we thought it was. And it is terrible. It's horrible. Uh, but since that time, well, we've dealt with many, many people. And we, we realize now how common it is in the household of faith amongst ministers and amongst deacons and amongst just the laity. And it shouldn't be. If sure, of all things, it shouldn't be amongst the ministers and the deacons. But I'm sorry to say it is. If we, if we stand here to testify that we've prayed for people in, that, in those categories with, the, with this problem. And, but the Lord is, is gracious and merciful to set the captives free. As we come and confess our sins and ask the Lord for mercy. He's, he's gracious and merciful to help us. 
Well, uh, verse, uh, did I read uh, here in Deuteronomy 28, did I read verse 13 and 14 to you? Uh, no, I didn't. <clears throat> and this applies to us right now. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. But what, what's, what is it? If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And the Lord is, is, is commanding us every day, this day, now, to observe and do his commandments, which he has laid down in these areas of our lives. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, either to the right hand or to the left. That means you go right down the middle of the road, and you don't stray off on either side. And if you do, then the Lord is merciful and gracious to, uh, to, 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 to hear our cry as we come back and cry unto the Lord. And help us, if we stray, to come back quick and to cry unto the Lord, that His mercy will be extended unto us instead of His wrath. You know, uh, uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, and we all quote it, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a wonderful verse. And every one of us here, I hope, has applied that to our life, that the blood of Jesus has been applied uh, because, he, he, because God gave his only begotten Son. But he gave it for all the world, that all the world might be saved. And now, uh, uh, the traditional uh, Christian church tells us that Christian people can't have all these, these problems, that when they got saved, it all went away, especially when they got the Holy Ghost, it all went away. Well, I wish it were true, but I can't find in the Word of the Lord where, the, where any place in the Word of the Lord it says that. Sorry if you disagree with me, but I can't. The Word says that God gave His Son that the whole world might be saved. Is the world saved? Tell me. Not even 10% of the world. But He gave His Son for the whole world. They should all be saved then, shouldn't they? You turn around and take the scripture, Galatians 3.13, that says that Jesus became a curse so we don't have to bear the curse. So they say, when I got saved, that automatically applied, so all these curses are broken off of my life, and they don't apply to me anymore, and I'm free. Scripture don't say that. No more than it says that by John 3.16 that everybody in the world is saved. You have to apply it to your life. And unless you take that, the scriptures, and apply it to your life, they will not work in your life automatically. You must apply the Scripture to your life, and then it will work. And, and, and God showed that to us it, 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 when He sh showed us these things about, about the eating of blood and fat and, and, and about the, the, this about incest. God showed us that we were in error and mistaken when we thought that everything was taken care of when we got saved. And God showed us that we have to apply it. We have to apply the fact that Jesus became a curse so we don't have to bear the curse. We, I have to take that and make it part of me. And I have to apply it to my life. I have to apply it to the areas of my life wherever that these curses are, are. God says that he visited the curses upon us to the third and the fourth and the tenth generation. God said he did it. And therefore, if God did it, then we've got to use God's plan and God's way and God's scripture to get out from underneath them. And I thank God for grace, for if it wasn't for grace, every one of us in here deserves to be stoned. And except for that grace, that would be our lot to be stoned. But by grace, we have an opportunity to serve the Lord and to come under His grace and to, and to be set free from these abominable things that we're tormented with and that have followed us down through the generations from our ancestors that we have inherited. And I have inherited them, and you have inherited them. And, and, but God has made a way through His Son the, the, that He became a curse so these curses can be broken off of us. And when, uh, when, when we realize this, and, and when, when Becky, uh, who the Lord made the revelation to about eating of blood and that she had sugar diabetes because her ancestors had, had eaten of blood contrary to the word of the Lord, and when we took this scripture and applied it and that Sunday morning and here and, and prayed for all of us present, and God broke the curse and set her free from it, and she's never had any of it since. And, then, and the rest of us that were here, we, we, we likewise participated in the same prayer. And, and I don't expect to ever have any of it in my family line. However, I'm not aware that my family ever ate blood or blood pudding. I'm not aware that they, that they ever did, but that doesn't mean it's not, that they didn't. Because I don't know. Uh, I can't go back four generations and know what my family did. Uh, it's bad enough to know just what my mother and father did, partly, which, I, uh, which none of us really know. So, you know, 
when, when we pray to break these curses and these things, <clears throat> if there's nothing there, wonderful. You have nothing to lose. But if there is something there, and, and you participate, and you're set free from it, you have everything to gain. You know, I, I've come to the conclusion that every time I'm in a service where there's any kind of a prayer prayed, I don't care what, if it applies, I apply it to me and I pray it. I participate in, in whatever the ministry is, I participate. Because it sure can't hurt me, and it's a whole lot of it might help me. And that's what I want. I want all the help that I can get from whatever source that God is sending, whoever the minister is, I want whatever help that God has sent my way at that time to minister, I want, to, I want to get all that I can get. If, if it's something that I've never understood in the Word, praise God for it. If there's, if there's something that comes and, and, and a prayer is offered or, or somebody wants to, to pray for me or something, I'll take all the prayers you've got. I'll not turn any of them down. And I appreciate, beyond all I can ever tell you, all the prayers that's prayed for this place. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Only God can reward you for it. And I thank you for it. I bless you. Well, uh, I'll get back to praying about these things that we've talked about in a little while. Irma's going to come here now, and she's going to continue on in, the, in, uh, in whatever vein the Lord's led her. But it's in areas that the Lord has given us an understanding. And it's worked in our lives by a, a revelation of the Lord, or it's come to pass because we have uh, 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 it's, it's happened with somebody we've prayed for. It's not things that somebody has told us about. We're, we're not here telling you hearsay. We're here telling you what we know that we know. I borrowed a belt. Oh, you borrowed a belt? Okay, let's see what I can do about it. There we go. Got it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Incest is the closet demon, dear, dear Abby says. You know that everybody is writing about incest in the papers and on TV, you see it. And we think, oh, how horrible. But... When it's in the church, that's where we've got to get rid of it. You've had sexual relations with your sister or with your brother or your father's molested you uh, or your mother. <laughs> you need deliverance from it because it's a, it's a thing that's in the back of your mind and it bothers you. It's a tormenting thing. It's a tormenting spirit. And it's no disgrace to have it, but it will bring disgrace to you if you keep it. After you've heard the light, after you've seen these scriptures and you start reading the scriptures you know back in 1965 after the lord sold our business and and i really started to study the word now i grew up in the assembly of god preacher's home and uh, uh my daddy preached about the devil being at the dance hall and the movies and certainly he is there and still is there but he never understood about deliverance and uh i didn't know anything about it but I heard a sermon once on deliverance by Dr. Derek Prince. And right then I knew that I had them. I wasn't worried about anybody else at that time. I knew I had demons and I wanted them out. And I would tell Glenn and he'd say, no, no, you're just imagining things. I'd tell my daddy and I was his darling only daughter. And he'd say, oh, honey, no, you don't have anything wrong with you. But I knew I did. And I kept seeking the Lord. You know, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, the second chapter of Joel says they're going to be delivered. And I started reading my Bible. I started seeing all kinds of things that I hadn't done or I had done that was wrong. And, and I started seeking the Lord. And one thing I used in my prayers was the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from all evil. And I would cry out to God to deliver me from all evil. And I couldn't find anybody that would believe that I had anything wrong with me. I remember I stirred up the whole church one time in our Sunday school class, this big Assembly of God adult class, by asking if the Bible really means that if you're fearful, you're going to go to the lake of fire. Oh, my land. I got so many phone calls in the afternoon, I couldn't believe it. I was trying to be honest. I knew I had a lot of fears in me. And... Uh, I started seeing all these things. I read Matthew 24 one day, and that really, Glenn wouldn't even let me talk about that. He thought my good school field Bible had gone haywire. And God began to open things, and I began to see to covet the best gifts. How many here covet the best gifts? That's not wrong to covet the best gifts. And I started to covet the discerning of spirits, but I didn't even know what that meant, really. 
And the Lord began to open my eyes. And when Brother Tromley talked about being in Sweden, we were in Sweden. Maybe, did you go on the first airlift? We were there. And uh, uh, I was trying to get somebody to listen to me that I had demons and I needed to be delivered. And I would tell Glenn. And I had a list. I made a list. The Lord would, now that was before the Hammonds, because we led the Hammonds into deliverance. So, so that was before the Hammonds book. That was before anybody's list. The Lord kept showing me these things, and I'd write them down. They were very piddly, I'll tell you. I didn't put down the bad things. I put down, you know, the little things. But I knew they were demons. And, and uh, so I plagued Glenn, pleaded, cried, begged him to ask Derek Prince if he would pray for us. So we went to his room, finally. And uh, we get in there, and I had been a department manager and, and supervisor for years and years and years, and I wasn't really afraid of engineers, and I'm not afraid of preachers, because I grew up in a preacher's home, and they're all made out of the same stuff all of us are, and so that didn't bother me. But when I got in there with Derek Prince, I'm telling you, my whole body trembled and shook. But see, I didn't know the Word of God enough. Even growing up in church since I was 10 years old, I didn't know the Word of God enough to know that the demons was what was making me tremble. They were trembling. And so, uh, Derek said, you know, in his English stoic way, way back there in 1960, was that 66, 65, 66, somewhere like that? And he said, oh, do you think you need deliverance? I, I said, yes. And Glenn pipes up and says, she's got a list. And, of course... <laughs> That made me more scared. And uh, Derek said, do you have a list? And I went. And, uh, and he said, where is it? It was in my person. You know, I was so scared and fearful of him. I thought it was the real me. It wasn't the real me at all. It was those evil spirits in there. And I was too frightened. And they would not let me get that list out. So they finally fooled around with me for a little while, and I was wanting to be delivered, but then I didn't want everybody yelling at me. And, and so they all got up and walked out, and I came home from Sweden crying, wanting to be delivered. If you keep on crying out to God, you're going to get delivered, because I, I finally found somebody that would pray for me. And it, do, it doesn't happen overnight, I'll tell you. These things did not come in to any of us overnight. They're all different facets in our bloodline. Uh, sure, I'm of German and English descent, and I don't know who ate blood sausage and blood pudding. It, I can't even stand rare meat. But, but uh, anyway, we started to more and more study the Word of God, and finally about the next year, or that fall, I think, somebody came to Los Angeles in a hotel downtown, and we heard about it. Now, you say that was an accident. It was an accident that we heard about it, really. But it was the grace of God and the answer to my prayer. And that, that revival lasted seven weeks. And I tell you, that man was on fire. One day he would have, he'd teach on deliverance. And the next day he might teach on uh, praying over us all for a gifts of the Spirit. And the next day something else. And the next day. And sometimes he would make me mad. You know, I had that big Pentecostal high hairdo holy hairdo and he would walk down the aisle with a glass of water and drink about half of it and then just sling it on all of us if you just been to the beauty shop and paid a lot of money to get your hair done you sure didn't want water to throw down it. he said he did it to see how many would sizzle <laughs> do you know do you know that the bible teaches that uh, if you've had drinking in your background that that is anger and rage now, I had not, we were saved in 1932, I was about 10 years old, and, but before that, my dad used to make moonshine, and he, he used to give it to me, and to my brother. And see, that anger would rise up. Anything that rises up in you that is not normal, that you hate, is an evil spirit. I may as well tell you that right now. But this man, finally, after seven weeks, I'd get so mad I wouldn't even go for two or three nights. I could feign almost sickness or anything. You know how you can get a headache if you don't or want to go to church or you're too tired? Well, finally, he called us after that meeting was over, and he said, there's five couples the Lord has showed me that's been coming to these meetings. 
that I should go to their house and pray. And he came to our house and he prayed. And what a deliverance I had. I had a curse of death on me that had been on me since the day I was born. Because my grandmother was angry the day I was born because my mother was having a second child. My mother was an only child. And she didn't want my mother to have any more children. And that curse was on me. And I would go to death's door and go to death's door and go to death's door with everything from three-day measles on. And this man saw that, discerned that, and broke that curse off of me, curse of death. <clears throat> and I praise God for that. And he broke a lot of other things off of me. Oh, my man. They came out at me, those evil spirits. I wanted to be delivered so bad, I didn't care who knew it. And I, had, I was all fixed up. We had this real prissy, beautiful home. And, and uh, I put a big towel down because I had visions of... In those days, we didn't have paper towels. He used a bucket right down here. And I tell you, if you could handle him, you could stand any meeting. And, and he, would, he would line up people and pray for us individually and stick your head down in that bucket. And I wouldn't do it because I didn't want, I didn't want that. It was too much. But when he came to my house, I got my clothes basket. I lined it with paper towels. I put this big towel down so nothing would get on the carpet. And I was ready. You know what? I didn't even throw up. See, the word cast out means vomit. So it's nothing wrong to vomit, spit up, or bring up. I've thrown up plenty of sense and other deliverances, but, but that day, the Lord is not going to do it the way we want it. We are not going to tell God how to do anything. See, the way he moved two years ago is not necessarily the way he's moving in our meetings today. And so he, he gave the command. He, he called out about 25 at once, terrible things, horrible things. I didn't care. And all of a sudden, these things come out of me. They exploded from way down inside of me, and they just came out. And I began to pray in tongues and prophesy and, and do a little bit of everything, I guess. I was waving my hands, and when I did, I was on and up. We had a sunken living room, and I was up in the dining room, and he was down here. And our, we were about eye level when he's praying for me. And all of a sudden, I just had my eyes shut. You know, all Pentecostals pray with their eyes shut. I had my eyes shut tight. I was waving my arms, and all of a sudden, I touched him, and he fell to the floor like dead. And I went, oh, my demons have killed him. <laughs> I tell you, sometimes the Lord does things that we don't even imagine what's going to happen. I didn't know, really. There wasn't any, as my little grandson used to call it, slaining in the spirit. That was before Catherine Kuhlman and other people praying. And I, I am for slaying in the spirit if god wants to do a divine operation on any of us he can slay us in the spirit we couldn't stand it in the natural well anyway i kept studying the word and i kept crying out for deliverance now i thought i was all delivered about three days went by and all of a sudden i could feel some now you say well i don't go by feeling well i do i go by faith and i go by feeling i love the holy ghost and fire I love to feel that fire. I love to feel the anointing boil up. It's like vapors boils up through me. And when that anointing boils up through me like that, I mean things happen when I pray. And, and I love to feel the Lord. I love to feel his presence in here. I love to feel the angels round about. But I'm going to read to you in Joel 2 right now, and then we're going to go on. That's my little preliminary, and it's awful late already. Uh, Joel 2 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, and it's nigh at hand. And who can abide the day of the Lord? I wonder, who can abide the day of the Lord? And in the 11th verse, you need to study the whole book of Joel. It's wonderful. In the 11th verse, it says, The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for the camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And then it goes on and on, and it says, sanctify the fast and do all these things. And then it says that he's going to pour out his spirit in the last days on all flesh and on the daughters and the handmaidens and so on. And then in the last verse, verse 32, it says, and it shall come to pass that who, whoever, whosoever shall call. Are you a whosoever? Say, I'm a whosoever. I'm a whosoever. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, the place of praise in Jerusalem, at the type of the church, shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I'm not going to be mealy-mouthed about it. I want to be in the remnant, don't you? I want to be in this overcoming group. I want to be in this army. 
Now, an army, what do they do? They find out what the enemy does, and they let you know about it, and you war against the enemy, don't you? Now, I, I love that uh, sermon this morning. I got a lot out of it, Tommy. Uh, we have to overcome the world, and I pray to God that everybody in here has overcome the world. That's the 30-fold, as I understand it. You know, we quit drinking, smoking, uh, messing around and get with it and then we have to overcome the flesh and when the Holy Spirit takes you over you know it's so hard for some people to pray in tongues because they don't want to give up they can't let go they don't know how, how what to do to let their tongue let the Lord have them but then when we have to overcome the devil that's that in my estimation is the third realm is that, am I right? I'm no theologian. All these people who rattle in Greek around here and everything. I know how to type in Greek, but I don't know about all this. I just know what I've experienced. But I want to overcome the devil. And I started to make a real search of my own life. You cannot be delivered if you don't want to be honest with yourself. And if you lie to yourself, then you're going to the lake of fire. Is that what the Bible says? All liars. We're finding a part in the lake of fire. So you've got to be honest with yourself. And I, I, I stop looking at everybody else and I start looking and I say, Holy Ghost, turn the light on my heart and show me my evil ways. And I started to get deliverance. I would get deliverance at home by myself. I might vomit for three days. And my neighbor used to come over and we'd pray. And she'd say, Irma, you're going through your death days. I'd be ashen white, but I wouldn't be sick. But every time I'd go to the bathroom, I could just vomit up this horrible junk in me that didn't belong in there and then i would feel better oh i'd feel so good and the power of god you see if you when you we talk about people being filled with the spirit that is such a misnomer that is horrible false false uh, teaching we've got a smidgen of the holy spirit if we were really filled with the holy ghost i mean the demons would all be screaming right now out here you know that and we don't edify ourselves enough by praying in the Spirit. We need to pray in tongues all the time, every day, going to town, in the car, sitting at my desk, praying in the Spirit. You don't have to make a big lot of noise about it. Yeah, I used to pray in tongues real loud. And Glenn used to say, Irma, don't pray so loud in tongues. Well, if I'm fighting the devil, sometimes it still comes out. I try to obey him, you know, but... but, uh, but. And, and we, we had a lot of discussions about deliverance. And finally, right in the middle of the congregation of the righteous, Glenn keels over and rises around on the floor, and he starts getting delivered. And I used to get so angry before that, it would make me so mad that he couldn't see this, and, and that he couldn't see deliverance until I'd get his demons over on me. And he smiled, you know, and, and I know, and, and he, he came to me once, and he said, you know, preacher so-and-so told me I don't have any demons and so did so-and-so and I said well I have to live with you and I know you do <laughs> so uh, one day I walked up to one of these preachers and I said why do you keep telling Glenn that he doesn't have any demons I have to live with him and, and he does and uh, and he said he just laughed at me and he says who do you think that is talking out of him to you and, oh, what a revelation. I finally said, you mean the devil? He said, that's right. And I said, oh. And then after that, I didn't get mad. I just bound them all the time and did a little bit of everything. You know, you can pray all different ways. Pray till you. These engineers, when they're working on something, they work all, they try everything until they get the right thing. Perfect. And I keep on praying and praying and keep on praying. Keep on praying for your deliverance. If you can't overcome something, keep on praying. Because I'll tell you, it takes more than once. I don't care what anybody says. It takes more than one prayer to get delivered. And uh, so we went to Sweden. I'll tell you about what happened. We went to the largest Pentecostal church in the world at that time. And, of course, I'd read about the Pentecostal banjo. I thought it was wonderful, and I was going to get to go to this wonderful church. And I got in there. Here is this great big church full of people. I couldn't feel one drop of the Holy Spirit in there. I really couldn't. And I sat there, and all of a sudden, my spiritual eyes were opened. And, well, yeah, I was... And, and, and what I saw, it frightened me half to death. Really, it did. 
Because now, remember, I was just starting a little bit about deliverance, and I hadn't even been really prayed for. I was wanting it. But all of a sudden, all of them turned into, their heads turned into skulls, like death heads. And they all had on gray shrouds. And I didn't know what that meant. I had to go and ask some preacher, where, where, why would I see that? Oh, it was just terrible, I told him. They said, that's spiritual death. Have you ever been to church with a spiritual death? I don't like spiritual death myself. I want to get rid of it. Let's go over to Amos, just right over a little ways. Amos 5. Seek the good and not the evil. 14th verse. Seek good and not evil. You know we're supposed to hate evil? That's part of the fear of God is to hate evil. And I mean you've got to hate it in yourself. Don't look at everybody else. Look in your own self, and where, where there is evil, hate it. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil, and love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. Where's the gate? Where's the gate? Eyes, ears, and so on. Judge yourself. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant. I want to be part of that remnant. Now let's go back to Ezekiel. 14 and 22. I want to take you real fast here for a little while. Yet behold, 22nd verse, Therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings. And ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, or the church, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when you see their ways and their doings. And ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. You know that God, Jesus didn't die on the cross in vain. He died that we might be freed from these curses. That was the reason why he was hung on a tree. I like to say hung on a tree and not a cross. He was hung on a straight up tree with his hands like this. And... He was made a curse because everybody that was hung on a tree in those days were cursed. And he, was, he bore that curse for us. So we can be delivered from these curses, but we have to ask him to do it. We have to ask him to deliver us from the curse of incest, from, the, from all the different curses, the curse of sicknesses, all kinds of diseases that uh, Deuteronomy 28 talks about. If you want to see about the curses, read it. Read all about uh, consumption and read all about cancer and tumors and hemorrhoids all those things read about it they're curses and when we can get free from those we're going to walk in divine health like we've never had divine health but you see we're not all free of them yet i'm free of a lot of them but i'm i'm not standing up here and telling you i'm all free of all curses some of them see we're all under the curse brother tomley would probably like this patty said to me the other day something about when even adam said you know she said they put us under a curse that we have to obey the, the men, and uh, we're still under that curse. And we started laughing about it, but that's true. Women were cursed in childbirth. Well, some people are having painless childbirth, and I don't mean by Lamaze either. That's demonic, but, but uh, they are being delivered from that. I think we can come out from under that curse, don't you? Why would Jesus die? He didn't die in vain. He died to deliver us from the curse. And we need to look about all these curses. They're all through the Bible. And, and I want to talk about a little bit. You know, the Bible says, everybody goes around quoting, resist the devil and he'll flee. That's a bunch of malarkey. You have to read, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. you got to read the whole thing. Don't just resist the devil. Devil, you better go away now. Oh, you're all right, honey. Praise God. Go pray. No. Submit to God. Resist. How do I resist? This is the end of Part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.